Hi, and welcome to The Wholeness Shift. In this vlog, I'm going to be talking about medical information and surgical information and women's issues, women's health issues. So if any of this is uninteresting to you or makes you squeamish or anything like that, this is your warning to view at your own discretion and to see your way out if you're not interested. Now, if you're nosy <laughs> and you wanna know what's happening, or if you are a woman who is either going through these issues or is going to be going through it, stick around and let me share my experience and what I've been going through so that maybe you know what to expect. Maybe you'll find out that you're not alone in some of the things that you're experiencing. But if this isn't for you, exit now. <laughs> if you're just finding me, my name is Veronica. I am the founder of The Wholeness Shift, a YouTube channel and a business where I teach people about easy practical spirituality. So this isn't my normal content, but you know, I do vlog occasionally and in those vlogs I just share my life and I teach on all kinds of topics. So this is off topic for what I normally talk about, but I just thought it was important I really hesitated to make this vlog because, I mean, who wants to talk about their embarrassing, intimate details on the internet? <laughs> not me, not me. So, um, but I did think it was important. So just know that this is quite uncomfortable for me, but it's important. There's so many forces out there right now that are against women or they don't want women to thrive. And so as women, we need to support each other and uh, help educate each other and um, just have each other's backs, right? So I'm sharing these details of my life and my body in an attempt to educate and support and um, let you know you're not alone. I mean, First and foremost, I am a woman going through these things. But second of all, I'm also a nurse. And as a nurse, I, you know, I like to educate people on all areas of life. If I'm able to help teach, I wanna teach. So that's why I'm making this video. So on December 27th, 2023, I had really five surgeries rolled into one. I had a total hysterectomy. They took my cervix, uterus, and both tubes. They left my ovaries, obviously. I had a bladder sling. I had cystocele and rectocele repair and pelvic floor reconstruction. So, ouch. <laughs> Let's just start there, like, ow. So the backstory and the reason for the surgery, in a nutshell, was that in 2011, I had an issue with really bad hemorrhaging. I woke up on Easter morning, whether that was in March or April that year, I'm not sure. Easter morning of 2011, I woke up massively hemorrhaging. The insurance company didn't want to pay for surgery or any kind of procedure until we tried other means of getting the bleeding to stop first, like, taking a pack, a month's worth of back birth control pills, a whole pack every day. Like every so many minutes I had to take another pill. And that did work to a point, it didn't totally work, but it subsided it down to like a light flow and sometimes just spotting. But after five months of that, I mean enough is enough. And they finally said in September of 11, all right, we believe you. <laughs> you can have your choice of either a hysterectomy or an ablation. With the hysterectomy, I would have had to be out of work for six to eight weeks. I was a single mom of four kids. I couldn't be out of work like that. And so I chose the ablation and they were like, it's gonna be so easy. You can be back to work the next day. They lied, <laughs> it wasn't that easy. Um, but I did go ahead and get the ablation. And if you don't know what an ablation is, an ablation is, if you've ever seen a doctor performing surgery or 
an old war movie, you know, where they take a hot blade and they stick it on a wound to burn it so it won't bleed. Same concept. They, um, they basically take like a Ziploc bag and they stick it up inside your uterus and then they pump that Ziploc bag full of scalding water and it scalds the inside of your uterus and burns it so that as it heals and scars over, there will not be any more ability to bleed. Now, because of that, um, you can no longer obviously carry a viable pregnancy. So if you have that procedure, you also have to have your tubes done. You have to be sterilized. So um, they chose to put, I was always told that they were pronounced Escher coils, but my gynecologist now calls them Escher coils. Tomato, tomato, you pick which one you want to use. So um, they put these coils that look like a little spring from the inside of an ink pen. If you know, you know the pens that click, click, there's a spring inside. That's kind of what they look like. And they take these little springs and they like screw them up inside of your tubes. And the thought process is that as they heal and scar over, an egg won't be able to get through. So that was in 2011 and everything seemed to be easy going since then. I mean, I have other health issues, but that seemed problem solved. Everything's good, no more periods. Um, easy peasy, done. Well, fast forward to spring of this, uh, spring of 2023, and like May, I think, I, out of the blue, started having this really intense stabbing, shooting pain in my lower abdomen. And so they, I got an exam, uh, they couldn't figure out what it was, what's going on. Um, so they did a CAT scan and it turns out that one of those coils had come dislodged and was now embedded in the wall of my uterus. So it had been tumbling around in there and like was burrowing into other organs that where it shouldn't be. So they were gonna have to do a hysterectomy to get that out of me. They were gonna take my uterus. Now, during research about these coils, like, has this ever happened before? Is this an issue? Turns out that this is not only an issue, it's a massive issue. Um, and just in 2023, Bayer, the maker of the coils, the pharmaceutical company Bayer, uh, B-A-Y-E-R, they settled a huge, class action suit for like $1.3 billion with the women who have had issues with these coils. And um, the other disconcerting thing about this was that not only were the coils coming dislodged and causing massive issues, like some of them escaped their uterus, made it into, like instead of going this way down the tube into the uterus that went that way out into the abdominal cavity and like pierced their bowels and like just all kinds of horrible things. Um, they were causing other health issues for these women like from heavy metal poisoning and whatnot in the body. Some of the common things were uh, onset of lupus, worsening of lupus, a sudden onset of migraines, yada, yada, yada. Well, coincidentally, going back to 2011 when they were placed, right? At that point, I had already been diagnosed with lupus for 20 years, but in that 20 years, I had never had bad effects of the lupus. I had never had to go on steroids. I had never had to have an injection or chemo or anything like that. Just kind of smooth sailing put these coils in my body and within six months, my health is tripping out. It is going nuts. I'm in the hospital for new onset migraines that have like stroke symptoms as an aura. I have to go on massive doses of prednisone, massive. Like if you looked at my face now compared to then, you probably would hardly recognize me. I had moon face so bad 
you know, when you're on steroids for a long time, you get what's called moon face because your face gets round like a moon. And um, I was on 60 milligrams a day. That's a massive amount. And my face was so round. I'll try to find a picture and insert it here. Um, it caused massive weight gain. I had to go on chemo for a long time. I'm still on it. So I think it's an awful big coincidence. It's actually not a coincidence at all that for 20 years I had none of that. And within six months of having these coils put in, I had all of that start. And <clears throat> I was really pissed off. I was really infuriated. And I was like, get these out of my body. So they agreed to do the hysterectomy and to take my tubes as well so that we get both coils out of my body. Now, during that workup, my doctor had said, you know, you're starting to have a little prolapse going on here. It looks like those uh, big headed babies. <laughs> I've had four children vaginally. Uh, it looks like those big headed babies did a number on you down there. And she's like, do you have any trouble with like leaking urine or anything like that? Like when you sneeze or cough or anything? And I'm like, you know, not so much anymore. No, maybe when they were first born. But, you know, I've kind of kegled my way back to health. I'm the kegel queen. And uh, she's like, I actually don't think that's true. And I'm like, what do you mean? And I said, I really only have any kind of urine leakage when there's like massive force, like if I throw up or if I'm jumping on a trampoline or running or, you know, like there's like heavy force. And she said, what it seems like is that your bladder has fallen. So it's not the Kegels that are keeping you from leaking urine. It's that like your ureter is normally a tube with a bladder on top. Your bladder has fallen over, kinked the tube. So you only leak the urine if there's a really strong force to get it past the kink. And I'm like, oh. And she said, uh, and your your vaginal walls are starting to collapse from giving birth to four babies. And um, plus I've been a nurse for almost 24 years and I'm standing on your feet all the time will cause your pelvic floor to kind of collapse. And uh, she's like, you're doing okay right now, but within five years or so, you're probably gonna start developing issues. So do you just want us to repair all of these things now or do you want to come back and do it all over again in a couple of years? And I'm just like, do it all. So that is why I went in for all of these issues and to get all these things done so that I can like get it done and not have to go back. Okay, so that's where we are. So my intention for this video is to take you through like the day of surgery through recovery for at least the first couple of weeks. The reason I want to do this is because everybody is different. And when I was researching videos like hysterectomy recovery, pelvic floor reconstruction recovery, bladder sling recovery, blah, blah, blah. Most of the videos that I found, these beautiful, lovely women who shared their stories, bless them and thank you for that, uh, they all did great. <laughs> and good for them. But like within a like within three days, they're up, their hair's done, makeup's done, they're leaving the house. They're like, we're going to lunch, we feel amazing. And on day three, I felt like I wanted to die. Like it was horrible. Those first three days were horrible. The first week was awful. And so I wanted to give a representation of what if you don't feel good after the first couple of days? Because sometimes that happens too. Everybody's different. And it depends on what you had done and it depends on all kinds of factors. So I just wanted to give a fair representation to the other side of it so that you know what to expect and that there is light at, at the end of the tunnel. So I want to take you through my pre-op and like the first couple of weeks. I also want to share with you the items that you might need. You might find that you need or would be helpful in your post-op period after this um, so that you can be prepared and have all that stuff purchased and ready to go before you have surgery. All right, let's get into it. I'll see you on the other side. So let me share some of the things that I purchased, things that I found invaluable. So I made a little graphic that I'm gonna stick up here 
and I have it on my phone right here. So I'm gonna look through this and just talk about everything. So things that I think will help you with your recovery process. Let's start with more of the pharmaceutical pharmacy side. So first of all, for pre-op, you will probably be told to buy some kind of HIBA cleanse. Um, you know, with past surgeries, they gave me this. So kind of crappy that they made me go buy it, but like whatever, it's not that expensive. And so uh, they usually will have you shower twice with it the night before and then the morning of and you have to scrub all over with this HIBA cleanse and uh, for this surgery they'll probably tell you to uh, pay very close attention and scrub thoroughly your private areas and then you're gonna have to repeat it again the next morning the worst thing is they don't want you to put on any lotion or creams or oils or after it like yeah, I was kind of non-compliant with this. Anywhere that they would be operating or could put like bandages or surgical glue or anything like that, I obeyed. I didn't put like on my torso anything, but like, girl, you know I put lotion on my feet and my hands and like, no, I am not gonna not <laughs> moisturize. Anyways, that's a whole other video. Um, so cough drops or throat lozenges huge in the first couple of days post-op because there's a very high chance that you will have a sore froggy throat from being intubated during your surgery. My mom said, I just learned this and I was shook. My mom said that when she had her hysterectomy, she stayed awake through the whole thing. I was like, what? why would you do that? She's like, oh, I don't like to be put to sleep. I'm like, y you're tripping. You're out of your mind. Like, no, <laughs> knock me out. I'll see you on the other side. So um, I actually didn't have too bad of a sore throat this time though. A little bit. I was froggy for a few days, like kind of hoarse, but throat lozenges. Ibuprofen, that is going to be your best friend. I am not kidding. Ibuprofen and Tylenol, alternate them. Um, I still have two weeks out. I'm still taking ibuprofen at least once a day, Tylenol at least once or twice a day. Um, probably two times each, I would say, kind of alternate them. Uh, gas X. Yes. Yeah. We are, I already talked about the bloating and everything else, but, uh, if you have a laparoscopic surgery, it's even worse. You, know, you have all that gas pain and it's not even gas from your bowels. It's, the gas they pump into your stomach for the surgery to inflate your belly so they could do the surgery. And then afterwards, a lot of that gas stays in you and gets trapped in there and it is so uncomfortable, it's painful. So taking the gas X will help. And um, so make sure you have some of those. I bought a bottle of the Walmart brand, the like great value or equate, um, anti-gas chewables and those helped a lot. Miralax, um, we already talked about that. This is gonna be so important for you because you don't want any, any straining or pushing or, how should I put this? You don't want any bulk. <laughs> you want things to just be nice and soft and like come out gently and easily. You don't want there to be any bulk that could put, put in pressure on your incision sites. You don't want to do any straining or pushing. Miralax is amazing because it really does dissolve down to nothing. I stick a cap full of it in my cup of coffee every morning. You don't even know it's there and uh, it helps you go. All right, so all the videos that I had watched said that you're just going to need some panty liners. That is true. You are going to need panty liners for sure, a lot of them. But the first day or two, I had way more bleeding than I anticipated I would have, and I did need to buy some pads. Um, I sent an SOS call out to my daughters, like, I need pads, somebody please get me some and get over here ASAP. Uh, so they had to go buy me some. But that only lasted about a day and a half, maybe two days. I had a lot of 
frank red blood had I wouldn't say heavy flow but at least normal flow like bleeding but it tapered off quickly after like a day and a half two days and then I was just left with a constant spotting like last few days of your period type spotting but it is constant um so you're gonna need a lot of panty liners you'll probably change them several times a day um the other thing that helped in the first week or so was a peri bottle you know the kind that they use after you give birth um you just have to, you don't have to put anything in it but warm water you know run the water till it's warm fill it up with just a little bit and then after you use the restroom or after you go pee you just squirt the water down there it will feel so good to you it will help get you clean because trust me that first week you don't even know what to do <laughs> with that area you're like what the f do i do with this like uh it's just like after you have a baby you're like i don't want to touch it it hurts <laughs> it's a mess down there it's like a battlefield like what the f do i do with this so um you can it's like a little bidet for your vajay <laughs> you can just squirt warm water on it gently and because like a regular bidet on a toilet that's going to be way too much way too much pressure please do not use that you will hurt yourself um but just gently squirt this water on there and then take some toilet paper and just pat it off and let's see ice packs Ooh, yes ice packs ice packs will be your best but outside you know after you have a baby they make an ice pack and put it down there on your crotch that's what I was anticipating, but what I found actually worked better was I turned them the other way and put them on my lower stomach and they were the perfect size for my stomach. Sometimes I use, well, most of the time I use two of them. I had like normal sized ice packs or cold packs for an injury in my freezer and I would have two to three of them going at one time. I would have one of these at least I have one of these across my lower stomach I would have one of these or a different kind going across my crotch and like every 20 minutes or so when they warmed up and they were no longer doing good throw those back in the freezer and switch them out for the next set um, those cold packs I they will save your life now my nurse in the recovery room was like no 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 you need to use heat think of like period cramps you want a heating pad so after like it was day two after like a day and a half of the ice i was like you know let me let me see what this nurse was talking about let me get my heating pad out and so i put my heating pad on to see if it was gonna help me at all because when i tell you i was in pain even with the ibuprofen and the tylenol and the occasional oxy it would take the edge off but like i was still writhing in pain like constant loud moaning groaning crying like writhing in pain and um so i was like maybe the heating pad will help more no it did the opposite and it actually caused me a setback because it's like it made things swell up in there more and all of a sudden I couldn't pee. It absolutely stopped my ability to go pee. I was really afraid I was going to have to go to the emergency room. I mean, I tried everything. I tried every position. I tried everything. I even tried getting in the shower and standing there with warm water running over me to see if I could pee standing up. Like I tried everything. I could not pee so I just decided to go lay down and sleep for a little bit with ice packs on me again and get rid of the heat and when I woke up two or three hours later the swelling had come down enough that I could pee so I say do what your body thinks is best but at least the few first couple of days you're gonna need ice packs 
The other thing that helped me was up in the right hand corner of this picture, you see like a little black pillow. And I will link all of the stuff that I'm able to link on Amazon down in the description, okay? So this was a little post-surgical travel pillow that you can, like if you have laparoscopic surgery and two things. One, like if you cough or sneeze or something, it's good to take that pillow and kind of splint your stomach with it to like put counter pressure so it doesn't hurt so bad. Two, in a car ride, like when you're coming home from the hospital, uh, you don't, it's so uncomfortable to have the seat belt like pressing on those incisions and whatnot. So this pillow has a pocket where you can stick some ice or an ice pack in there and you press it against your stomach and kind of put it between your belly and the seat belt so that it doesn't press. It helps you a lot. But even after I came home, I used this a lot on my stomach. Like I'd have one of those ice packs across the bottom, I'd have one on my crotch, and then I would have this one kind of splinting my lower stomach because those first couple of days when you're moving around, it feels like, it feels like your stomach is just gonna fall out. It feels like all your internal organs are gonna fall through your vagina out onto the floor. Like it just feels like there's so much pressure in there and like when you change positions or you you have to cough or you have to move like it to splint your stomach like either hold it and put pressure on it or use that pillow and put pressure it helps so much so you might want to consider that the other thing that i have was uh this wedge pillow at the bottom those are expensive, they really can be. So what I did, and I suggest you do before you buy one, because it was very helpful. I would recommend, if you can afford it, get it. But they are a little pricey, not gonna lie. So I actually found one on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, I guess some old lady had had surgery and uh, she no longer needed it and they were selling it for 20 bucks. So I got it and then I scrubbed it down really well. I used like 4X and um, what else did I use? Oh, like OxyClean or something. And I just like scrubbed the hell out of it to make sure like all her germs and stuff were off of it. And cause you can't put it in the washer. It looks like it has a zipper on it, but it's not usable. You can't take the cover off. So I scrubbed it and I set it out to dry and then it was fine, but it was only $20. So try looking on marketplace first if I were you. But that helped so much. And this particular one, it can open up like on the um on the sides it has like little velcro straps you undo and then you can like open it up and change the position so you can have like a high wedge you can have a very low one you can change it so that you could put your feet on it um that was very helpful i also bought an inflatable one that was only like five bucks i saw online like on amazon or something so i was on the sofa with my head elevated I could also put my feet up on this other wedge pillow. It, you blow it up like a pool floaty and um, it's covered in kind of a velvety velour material, kind of like an air mattress. And um, I didn't use it a whole lot, but that first day or so it helped a lot because it's really painful to lay flat or to like, even if you're elevated to like have your legs straight out, you really want to stay kind of bent to help your stomach not hurt so much. So. Just food for thought. Uh, abdominal binder. So some people, their doctor will give them one. Mine did not. So I actually purchased one and I didn't even think about it for the first couple of days and then like day three, it occurred to me that I had that and I'm like, oh, let me try this. Oh my God, that helped so much. Yes, it helped a lot. It helped, like I was talking about earlier, to like splint your stomach. It helped so much. Um, I will say, like some people I see, they're just wearing it kind of indefinitely. That is not good for you. Please don't do that. Because just like we talked about earlier, that like anytime you strain, push, pull, stand up, lift, um, cough, sneeze, move your bowels, any of those things that put pressure on your uh, pelvic floor, 
you need to avoid so that your your incision lines heal good well wearing that abdominal binder does the same thing if you think about it if you are putting that binder on and pushing in and putting pressure in that pressure has to go somewhere else it'll go up and down and if it goes down that's a problem so in the first couple of days wear it if you need it but you should not wear that long term it's kind of counterproductive and it could hurt you uh the last thing i have on here is a reacher grabber bar you know because it's hard to bend down it's hard to bend down it's hard uh, it, this helps you be a lot more independent like if you drop something on the floor you can pick it up if you're laying on the couch and like <laughs> the remote is on the coffee table and you're like I cannot get up uh, you can grab it with the grabber um, it has a lot of practical uses so especially if you're gonna be alone it's very helpful all right I hope that helped let me know if I've missed anything or what your thoughts are so that other people reading the comments will see what you recommend. Good morning. Um, it's 5.03 a.m. on December 27th, and I am awake. I woke up at 4.30. I actually got pretty close to eight hours of sleep. I'm not allowed to have anything to eat, and I can't have coffee, but I can have clear liquids, including black tea. So I'm actually making peppermint tea right now. Um, I figured that that would help calm me down a little bit, settle my stomach, and hopefully make my breath taste better. <laughs> because I mean, I brushed my teeth, but I just have such a dry mouth because I can't drink a whole lot right now. Courtney had to cancel. Actually, she said, um, I would still take you even if I have to show up in a hazmat suit with a big mask, mom. <laughs> I'm like, I know you would, honey, but I'd rather not risk being exposed. So, um, <clears throat> lucky her, she gets the day off. <laughs> so Fred is, he's messing with me because I, he's on his way here. I know he is, but I sent him a Facebook message a little bit ago that said, see you soon. And he responded with a like, hmm, emoji. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, boy, stop playing. You know, you're on your way. <laughs> Uh, I, I still feel like I have sleep all over me. Like I feel half asleep still. So I got up and I took my second HIPAA cleanse shower. And um, I mean, every area of my body is so clean, you could eat dinner off of it right now. I mean, it's usually clean, but you know what I mean? I, have, I had to scrub last night and this morning with all of that surgical, that antimicrobial stuff. And anyways, we is clean. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I know it's all for my best and it's all for my good. But I'm still nervous, you know? I mean, you go under anesthesia and you have surgery. It's natural to be nervous. I keep telling myself that it's natural to be nervous. But I just, I keep fidgeting. I'm like messing with my hair. I'm like, everything's okay. Everything's just so, move this here, move it back. Like I'm just fidgeting because I'm nervous. Um, but it's all gonna be okay. Anyways, see you on the other side. <laughs> I was lost in a city dream And I was at home again beside the stream Then you walked past me And you saw me and smiled
parody, right? Good morning. It is the morning of post-op day one. It's about 7.10 a.m. and I've been up since about 5.30. Couldn't sleep anymore. I wish I could. Um, I couldn't really film anything last night. I was just in too much pain. It was pretty bad. Um, so I'm up right now trying to have something to drink and Fred's in there making oatmeal. And I would say I'm doing okay. My bleeding has slowed down considerably and my pain is for sure still there, but instead of being like a nine or a 10, it's probably a seven, eight or nine, depending on what I'm doing. Like right now I'm sitting up so that I could drink some coffee and eat. It's killing me. I just had Fred go upstairs and dig through a closet to find like one of those squishy pads you sit on um, and put that under me because right now I feel like my whole insides are going to fall out my butt. <laughs> Everything just hurts. It feels like I'm sitting on concrete. So as soon as I'm done eating, I need to try to lay back down. Plus I'm getting kind of dizzy and nauseous sitting up like this. I am due for more medicine. I could take some if I wanted, but I just took ibuprofen about two hours ago. And so I kind of want to space them out a little bit more than that. So I'm alternating the ibuprofen and Tylenol and I also have a couple of Oxycontins that I could throw in if I need. They only gave me like four or five of them, I think. And I've already taken two. No, maybe I've only taken one. Anyways, good morning. <laughs> so it's a little after 11 on um, post-op day one. And... I feel horrible. <laughs> My pain is way better than it was last night, as I said. And really, it's just when I move around, once I get into a comfortable spot, it's not too bad. But I notice I'm really nauseous and I have a headache and I feel dizzy. I just don't feel good. So that's where I am now. So I'm just laying on the couch resting and uh, trying to stay hydrated and I just ate a little something, but day zero was horrible. Day one's a little better, but still horrible. It's the evening of post-op day one. Zero out of 10 do not recommend. I am so miserable. There's no good way to sit or to lay. I've been alternating Motrin and Tylenol and taking a pain pill in between somewhere when I get a chance or if I really need it. They only gave me five of them. I have two left. I'm nauseous and sick and um, in so much pain. Today is post-op day two. It's Friday the 29th. I'm feeling a bit better than I did last night. Last night was, um, last night was probably the roughest I've had. I think pain-wise, the first night, post-op day zero, was the absolute worst pain. Like, it was just so sharp and stabby. And it morphed into, like, a a achy, crampy, really intense pain.
pain since then. But I think by I think by last night I um my emotional reserves were starting to give out, so it made it tougher. And I just could not get comfortable. I couldn't lay, I couldn't sit. As of today, I'm I am able to void just fine. Well, I wouldn't say just fine. Girl, that's a lie. <laughs> um, there is nothing the same about peeing or urinating after this surgery. You think you know what it's like to go pee. <laughs> At 50 years old, you kind of figured it out, how to use the restroom. But uh, now it's totally different. Like the muscle that you would normally work to like start your stream and stop your stream, like non-existent like it has nothing to do with it it's the strangest thing it's a little disconcerting I I hope that it gets better I can't even explain to you what it's like it's like <laughs> I just got the song in my head I'm a little teapot <laughs> except it's probably I'm a little peapot um normally you sit down you start peeing well now you you sit down and you just have to kind of like tilt your pelvis or move around until you find a spot where it just starts coming out <laughs> so like one lady in one lady's video she said I have to lean all the way back uh, instead of sitting upright I have to lean all the way back and then it'll work that does not work for me I have to kind of sit forward and as soon as I lean my body forward and tilt my pelvis, the urine will start coming out. I know that that's a little TMI, but you know, if you have this surgery, you're gonna wonder what the heck is going on and um, what do I do about it? <laughs> so FYI, it's not gonna work the same and you just have to figure out, you, you have to do a little potty yoga to see <laughs> which position helps you to pee in. <clears throat> I can't believe I'm putting all this on the internet, but you know what? If it helps people, so be it. As of this morning, I'm officially alone here, which is also disconcerting. Both Courtney and Amelia have um, been exposed to COVID, so they can't come near me, at least for several days. And my daughter Maddie, I just, I have no idea. She hasn't reached out at all. So I'm here and I just played hell trying to find a comfortable position. There's no such thing for myself, like sitting up right now, not, not happening. Oh my God. As soon as I even start to sit down and any kind of pressure gets put on my bottom, whoo, oh my God. It's like my whole body goes into like, oh God, we're in trouble. Um, yeah, really, really painful. So I have to, like if I'm trying to eat or something, I have to sit up, but like lean to the side and sit more on my hip. But even that is excruciating. I end up having to lay down. And, um, which is making my back and sides and hips hurt. Laying here so long. I'm not used to laying like this. I'm used to being up and moving. It's kind of killing me. Clearing my throat like that is starting to hurt less. You know, the other day when I would cough or clear my throat, it still hurts, but it doesn't feel like a bomb is exploding in my crotch <laughs> that's going to blow everything apart. Um, I still don't have much of an appetite. Last night, Fred ordered us some burgers and whatnot, and I took like two bites I'm not a big burger person normally, but it sounded good. So he got both of us one. And of course, he scarfed his. Um, I took two or three bites and maybe a couple bites of an onion ring and I was done. I was like, I can't do this. I don't really want anything. My sinuses have been killing me. Oh my God, my nose is just so bad. <laughs> And my eyes, my eyelids, well, my eyes are so puffy, but it's like they, when I was unconscious, when I was intubated, they like taped my eyes shut 
and then they just like ripped off the tape or something because I have like a, a cut on my eyelid and um over here I don't know if you could see it at this angle or this light but it's like I had a little black eye starting over here so I wonder if they did the same thing over here somehow but I do know that I'm extremely puffy I'm up a solid eight or nine pounds from when I went into surgery so I still am retaining a whole lot of fluid and if if fluid two point so two point two pounds equals a liter of fluid and I'm up nine pounds so you can do the math it's a lot of fluid so I just took a water pill to try to get some of that off and um, hopefully my bladder cooperates because that would not be good but I've got to get some of that fluid off of me anyways I'm just rambling at this point so it's about 6, 10 uh, on the evening of post-op day two. And I think I've turned a little bit of a corner. Either that or I just still have oxycodone in my system and I feel a little better. <laughs> but um, I noticed that I'm able to move or change positions a little bit easier. I'm able to stand up and sit down slightly easier. I don't scream in pain as bad when I do. Um, I'm using the restroom easier. Um, the doctor called in something for nausea, so uh, someone just went to pick that up for me, so I think that'll help as well. Um, I still don't have much of an appetite. I tried to eat a little something earlier and I got a couple bites in and that was about it. Um, just trying to stay hydrated the best I can, but just chugging along. Um, I will touch base with you tomorrow, post-op day three. It's Saturday, December 30th, and it's about five o'clock in the evening. It's post-op day three, and I would say that some things got worse today and some things got better. <laughs> I feel like I've turned a corner um, I can be much more independent in a lot of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. My throat's still a little torn up from being intubated. I can get up and go to the restroom by myself um, without screaming in pain. Uh, so some things have gotten easier. But I've noticed that like the pain pills and whatnot just aren't touching the pain the same way they were. So it feels like I'm always in more pain. I know that doesn't make sense. I feel like the constant pain is always there instead of being dulled or taken away by the pain meds. Um, but where I used to have really horrible pain, which was during movement or changing positions, that has gotten better. It's still there, but it's manageable. Um, I still don't have a whole lot of an appetite. I'm nauseous, but I don't like the way the Zofran, make, Zofran makes me feel. <clears throat> so I don't like to take it. Other than that, um, ice packs and laying down are my best friends. Ugh. Someday I'll feel more human and I can like do my hair and my makeup and like feel normal. Today is not that day. <laughs> so it is what it is. You get what you get. The other thing is my best friend is cough drops, throat lozenges. I think I'm going to go get one. Like I said, my throat is so, I wouldn't say it's raw, but it's torn up and um, I feel very froggy, but I'm doing okay. I'm doing actually not bad considering the circumstances. All right, I'll talk to you guys probably tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Happy New Year's Eve. <laughs> I am struggling today. It is not a good day so far.
I almost went back to the hospital this morning. I just don't feel good. And um, I was in some pretty good fluid overload earlier. I'm still, even after taking just tons of diuretics, um, I'm still 10 pounds up. I actually gained another pound today. Um, I still haven't been able to go to the bathroom or, you know, move my bowels or anything. So I'm dealing with that as well. TMI, I know, but you know, this is all post-op stuff, what you can expect. That's why I said turn away if you're squeamish. <laughs> um, I just felt like, and I was starting to have bad palpitations and um, I just didn't feel good. Like yesterday I had turned a corner and thought I was feeling a little better. Well, today I had turned back around the corner and around another corner. <laughs> like I took a couple steps backwards. I just not feeling good. I'm really nauseous. Um, no appetite. Now I found out that my grandson has a high fever and um, so I'm really worried about him. And I'm just here alone and um, you know, when I don't feel good, I tend to get like emotional and um, tearful and that's kind of what I've been dipping in and out of. I'm like, no, I'm okay. We're doing good. My body knows what it's doing. We're going to be fine. And then I just have this moment where I fall into this pool of self-pity and like, I'm lonely. Nobody loves me. <laughs> you know, just feel sorry for myself. And then I'm like, girl, stop it. You're fine. We're going to be okay. So then I'll pull it together. And then I'm like, no, it's New Year's Eve and nobody even cares about us. And then I'm like, shut up. I get on my own nerves, trust me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't feel good today. I don't think that I'm going to go to the hospital at this point. I hope that things start moving. I am, on a, on a different note, I am moving around way better. Um, still pain, but nothing like it was. There's a little spot in my like right lower quadrant, like down where your appendix might be. They must have tied the stitches extra tight or something because that spot, it hurts no matter how I move. Like I just have to blink and I swear to God, it pulls those stitches <laughs> and I get this sharp pain like pew, zapping through there. But other than that, um, not doing too bad with the pain. It's pretty pretty good. Not bad at all. Can't complain, especially knowing where I came from. Oof. That was some intense pain right after this, but you know, day four and it's pretty manageable. Can't complain. I feel like this is just one redundant day after another, like Groundhog's Day. It's just the same thing day after day. This is going to be the world's most boring vlog ever. <laughs> oh. It's the night of post-op day number four, uh, which is also New Year's Eve. It's about 10.40 p.m. and I can't make it another minute. <laughs> I'm too miserable. I've got to go to bed. Um, today was a really rough day. It's like every day gets better in some ways and gets way worse in other days. T tomorrow's going to be better though. Happy post-op day six, <laughs> January 2nd. I keep waiting for that day where I wake up and I um, don't feel like flaming garbage. <laughs> I see these other people's recovery videos on YouTube and things like that and they're just like, day two, I feel great. And I'm like, okay, not gonna feel so bad. Girl, I feel like shit. <laughs> this morning I woke up feeling a whole different type of shit than I've felt so far. 
um, like, pain that I hadn't had before. It's just different, intense nausea. My head is throbbing. I don't feel good. I just don't feel good. I feel very weak. Like, I'm having trouble holding this phone. I feel very weak, very fatigued. Just like hot garbage. And um, when is that going to change? <laughs> and I just tried to eat something for breakfast. I tried to get some protein, you know, because I'm healing from surgery. You really need water and protein. That's what every cell in your body is made out of. So if you're trying to rebuild cells, you need water and protein. So I tried to eat some eggs, some scrambled eggs, which was just a mistake because I don't like eggs to begin with. And now I'm just like, <laughs> so sorry, this vlog isn't getting very much better, but like, this is real life and um, this is the journey. And I hope that if you are going to be having this surgery, I hope your journey is smoother and softer. But I think it's important to be aware that sometimes it takes a few days. You don't bounce back immediately. And um, that's okay. Your body's doing what your body needs to do. And it's important to just be patient with it and figure it out one day at a time. Overall, I'm doing okay, though. <laughs> Nausea, headache, pain. That's how day six is starting out. Today, I am one week post-op. I find myself in some kind of a ridiculous shame space. Like, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> What's wrong with me? that at seven days, I feel horrible. Like, I don't feel horrible all the time, but I have moments of horrible, like completely lacking vitality, horrible fatigue. Like, I just don't feel good. Um, I'm still in pain. And girl, I don't feel like doing my hair and makeup. What you get is what you get. You're getting me au naturel because no. I actually thought about doing my hair and makeup for this video. A seven day post-op. I can't even, I can barely lift my own laptop on my own. And I'm going to stand up there and do my hair and makeup. Because I felt some kind of stupid need to keep up with the Joneses. And this got me going down this, um, I don't know, a thought spiral like I normally do about, you know, the patriarchy and about the ridiculous pressure that is put on women to be all things, to never be an inconvenience, to be and look perfect at all times. And by God, even if you have a baby, you better have your hair and makeup done by that evening for family photos. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, and if you have major surgery, and like myself, I just had five major surgeries rolled into one, and I'm feeling some ridiculous pressure to, um, be back at it within a week like I'm getting messages going are you okay why aren't you responding can a bitch get a minute <laughs> can a bitch have a minute to recover like um I find myself getting really resentful of not that people are checking on me that's not it it's um of the pressure the external pressure and the self-imposed pressure because we're taught that that pressure is supposed to be there um, for women to have a certain standard of 
perfection and bouncing back and like never being down, never being an inconvenience. And I call bullshit. I, I resent that and I don't want to participate in it. I think that a lot of women, it doesn't even go that deep because they don't even think about it because as women, we're so ingrained to just be pretty and be sweet. And if someone reaches out, you respond. And if someone needs something, you jump in and volunteer. And like, I don't want to. I don't feel good. And most women never stop to think about that. The fact that like, because you're pre-programmed to do it, you do it and that inadvertently puts pressure on the next woman to keep up. Well, she did it, I better, or someone's gonna think less of me. And I say, we all just need to stop. If you legitimately feel great after a week, girl, good for you. That's amazing. If you <laughs> feel like hot garbage, after a week, don't worry about responding. Rest. Like, do I feel like making this video right now? 1000% no. But I'm doing it not so that I can keep up with my channel, not so that I can, not for any external. What's the word I'm looking for? Like validation or anything like that. That's not it. It's purely to be of service to my fellow women who might be going through this or are looking forward to going through, not looking forward. That's a horrible choice of words, but um, have this coming up in their future and they're wondering what to expect. I think it's important to know that you really don't know what to expect because some women feel okay and some women don't and some women have a ton of pain like I did and some women don't and Some women have a great support system that makes everything way easier and that could certainly contribute to their um, bouncing back quickly. I did not have that. Now, thank God for Fred. He was as much of a support system as a an ex-boyfriend who's not really involved but is willing to help a little bit can be. <laughs> so the journey really is individual and that's okay give yourself permission to be whatever it is that you are and to not be whatever it is that you are not to meet some ridiculous invisible standard that's being imposed on you like you should be feeling better by now. You should be up contributing by now. You should be able to do all your hair and makeup and look good for a selfie by now. You know, the doctor says to take a minimum of six weeks to recover. My doctor, I said, do you really think I'm going to need six weeks? And she's like, most women need a minimum of six weeks. That's just the starting point. At six weeks, most women could potentially return to an easy job if they needed to. Some women take longer, but you're not even fully healed for several months. And so if the absolute bare minimum of recovery is six weeks, girl, take your time. Allow yourself to process emotions, because, you know, this surgery is tricky, too. Like, for me, it wasn't as tricky because I dealt with a lot of these emotions back in 2011 when I had the ablation and the coils placed in my tubes. I dealt with that whole, I can never have kids again 
that kind of thing back then. So I grieved a lot of that back then. But even still, a lot of women, myself included, go through some emotional stuff like what do these, what does the loss of these female organs mean for me as a woman? Well, I mean, the bottom line in reality is that it doesn't mean anything. You are as much of a woman, whether you have a childbearing uterus in your body or you are not. <laughs> a woman is a woman is a woman, whether she has a uterus or not. A woman is a woman is a beautiful woman, whether she can actively have babies or not. That does not define how womanly and how feminine and how sensual you are as a woman. But a lot of times this is something that you have to wind through the path and make your way to. You have to deal with that grief of losing this part of yourself. You know, I had some thoughts of, I mean, that's, that's my womb that housed and grew my precious babies. I was kind of sentimentally attached to that. If you haven't been through it, it sounds weird to hear these things from the outside. You're like, that's kind of dumb or whatever. It's easy to judge those things. But if you've been through it, if you know, you know. There are all kinds of weird emotions that come up when you're going through something like this. And so you have this whole physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, you have all these layers of things that you have to deal with. And um, it's important that you allow yourself to take the time to feel them. Thank you for all of the love and support that has come my way. Thank you for the messages. Thank you for the cards. Thank you for the gifts. I appreciate them all. I accept them with the love in which they were intended and I'm grateful. I'm not going to do a whole lot of responding on social media because I'm just not up to it. Um, I have very little mental energy right now to expend and so I'm going to preserve what I can. Maybe once in a while you'll see me on there liking something or responding but um that just means I'm having a good few minutes. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm back. You know what I mean? So today is Wednesday, uh, January 10th, 2024. And I am two weeks post-op today, 14 days today. And even just a few days ago, I didn't feel good. Like my fatigue was like 10 out of 10. I could hardly get off the couch like I was wiped out that was the biggest thing that surprised me is how tired i am after this surgery just i normally have a lot of fatigue because i have lupus and that can bring a lot of fatigue but like this is a whole other level i was tired um but just in the last few days i feel way better i feel way way better now i still have some pain and discomfort but it's no longer overwhelming it's very manageable if you're a woman which if you're watching this you probably are it's really just like period cramps it's um lower abdomen up inside where your cervix would normally be but where the incision is now um and your lower back i mean it just feels like period cramps and um I am kind of achy in other places simply because I have been having to sit around for the last few weeks and not as much movement and physical activity. So like, you know, I don't have the most comfortable sofa either. So I'm, I'm sore from sitting around. I'm achy. Um, my back hurts, my neck hurts, my neck and my back and um, all of that. So, but as far as surgery related, period cramps, and I'm super duper 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 bloated still. It has gotten way better. And like during surgery, I had gained a whole 10 pounds and it lasted for at least a week. Um, 
but that has started to come down. I've lost about eight pounds of that 10. But even though I am taking the like gas pills, gas X once in a while, even though my bowels are now moving normally and uh, well, I wouldn't say normally, but they're moving. Um, so that's no longer a real issue. Um, I'm moving around a little bit more. My stomach, like you better be prepared to have some stretchy, comfortable pants <laughs> because my stomach is like rotund. It is so round uh, and bloated and it just is what it is. I don't even know if I could get a pair of my jeans on and buttoned. I probably could. I'm probably, it's probably exaggerated in my mind, but like, girl, I feel at least six months pregnant, five months pregnant. Like I feel bloated. So expect that. My appetite returned with a vengeance. <laughs> I did not have an appetite for a solid week, week and a half. And the other day, like a switch flipped and where I was struggling to eat a couple meals a day, I just, and like if I had a meal, I'd take a couple bites and I'd be like, I don't want any more. I just, ugh, I don't want it. Girl, <laughs> like the other day I was joking and it's not a joke, like it really happened. I was like, I had like three breakfasts, two lunches, I had second and third dinner, I had snacks, I was just like, I could not get enough food. It's like, as soon as I would take the last bite of something and be like, oh, okay, that's done, what's next? And I would already be thinking about the next meal. Like I could not quit eating, <laughs> but that's kind of settled down now. I think I was just catching up or something. My body was like, all right, it's on. And so, uh, yeah, appetite did come back. Now it's really just the mental game of knowing that you feel better. There are so many things you want to do, but you cannot do them. You are not allowed to do them. I don't care if you feel better. You cannot pull the vacuum out and start vacuuming your floor. You cannot uh, be lifting things and pulling things and you, you're, you cannot do that unless you want to sabotage yourself. Why go through all of this in order to just cause harm and not allow your body to heal properly? Um, you know, you have so many sutures in there and you have that pelvic vault that they've created and sewn shut and whatnot and like I was joking with uh, my daughter she's like you don't seem that limited anymore you seem okay and I was like well I am but I'm not allowed to do these things because basically honey you know like your uterus and your cervix it's not there to plug up that hole anymore they just kind of just like sewed it shut and sealed it up like a ziploc bag and if you pop those stitches like Girl, I don't want to have my intestines on the floor. I don't want that to fail. <laughs> so, like, I, you need to respect the rules, respect your body, because anything that you lift, push, or pull, by nature will put pressure on your pelvic floor and cause straining or pressure to go down there, and you can't have any of that. You can't have any of that. And so you just really have to be respectful of the rules. So yeah, I'd, I would say for me, just in the last day or so, days 13, 14, I started to feel a little better. I, not a little better, a lot better. Um, when this first, when you first start going and you're fresh, like my biggest piece of advice to you, seriously, if you normally have any issues whatsoever with sluggish bowel movements or constipation or anything like that, you need to start this bowel prep before your surgery, like a week before your surgery. Get things going and soft before your surgery. Not kidding. That was the most intense, excruciating pain in, that I was experiencing in those first few days and now I know that a lot of it was because I had a full bowel pushing on my surgery sites and then to also get that out of me dear lord in heaven that was awful awful I would not recommend that for anybody so 
if I were to go back in time with the knowledge I have now, what I would start doing is I, a week before surgery, I would start stool softeners and I would start adding Miralax to my coffee every day and just getting things going every day because that's what you're gonna have to do after surgery, stool softeners and Miralax every day. Um, and I would start doing that like a week before surgery so that I'm kind of emptied out and things are moving regularly and there's nothing uh, troublesome going on there. Um, that would be my number one thing. If you have any specific questions or concerns or thoughts uh, that I didn't cover, please put them in the comments below. I would be happy to answer your questions if I'm able to. And um, other than that, thanks for hanging out with me and thanks for watching. I really hope that this helped. I hope that if you're going through this, you're not alone. And I hope that if you're going to be going through this, that it helped you to better prepare for what you should, the things you should buy, the things you should think about, and good luck. Good luck with your surgery and your recovery, and please share your experience or your thoughts down below. All right, good luck, and thank you, and take care.